Well, good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Brian. Yeah, you could probably turn my volume down a little bit. We've been having weird sound issues this morning, but uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you guys here today. So we've been going through a series called In His Image about the fact that we've been made to be like God. And, and we're starting uh, today, we're going to focus on one part of us, which I think is going to bring a great degree of clarity, uh, especially as we kind of discover that we're, we're more than just one part. Uh, let, let me I guess start off with a few questions. Have you ever felt guilty about your past, right? Have you ever felt, you know, bad about the things that you've done or you feel kind of trapped in in the decisions that you've made uh, where you can't kind of get away from them? Or, or do you ever feel like you're battling to do the right thing? Where you, you know the right thing to do and maybe even part of you wants to do the right thing, but you still choose not to anyway? Right? Like, like, what's that about? Like, wh why, why can't I have, like, full total agreement in myself? Why is there some degree of conflict in who I am, right? D do you struggle with, with self-control? Or, or if you have self-control, who, who are you controlling? Or, or what part of you is controlling what other part of you, right? Like, what, what is that relationship? What's happening there? Right? Because sometimes I feel as though we think that we are just all, you know, kind of maybe like one thing, and then we get confused when there's this internal conflict, all right? Or we get confused about our identity, right? Maybe, maybe your value, your self-worth is based on who you see in the mirror, right? Maybe you feel terrible about yourself for the five pounds that you've been gaining year after year, right? That, that you just like evaluate yourself based on your appearance, right? Or, or do you maybe have a really hard thought life, right? Maybe, maybe some of your actions are under control, but just every once in a while you've got like stupid or sinful thoughts that just jump into your head and you're like, where did that come from, right? What's going on? What, like, I don't even want to think these things. What's happening here, right? And, and that's what I want to talk about today is that, that we have multiple parts to us, all right? That we've been designed where just like God who... We talked about in the last series is one God, but who presents himself in three persons that he's made us similarly with, with a degree of threeness about us, right? That we aren't just merely uh, what we see in the mirror. We aren't just merely our bodies and our physical desires, our need for sleep and eating, all right? We, mar we aren't just merely our, our thought lives, right? Or our conscious, right? Like that we're not just, you know, the total of what we're thinking and processing up here. Right? And, and it turns out that, that we have this, this spirit life about us, right? That there's, not that we are a, a trinity, but there's a, the common word is a trichotomy about us. That we have a, a spirit, or we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we, we live in a body, right? And, and I'm, so today we're going to focus on the spirit piece, but before I get there, I want to give you a verse. I'll have it up on the screen. You can follow along. Uh, and, and this is from 1 Thessalonians 5 where we kind of pull this idea from. It says, now, may the God of peace himself sanctify, all right, which means to make holy, to sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. So obviously this verse talks about God's faithfulness, that he's the one that produces genuine, real change in us, right? That's one of the reasons why we're excited about Celebrate Recovery that got started on Friday, because we want to give people genuine change, right? And we know that God is the source of that change. In this passage, there's this hope, this promise, right, that he's the one that is faithful to bring about that change. But the thing that I'm focusing on right now is not just that promise, which we should focus on the promises of God sometimes, but, but the fact that we have these three parts, right? That we are a spirit, we have a soul, right? Our mind, our will, and emotions, and we live in a body. And perhaps even just kind of that reality, the fact that I'm pointing that out, you might already be thinking back on the times when you've realized that your three parts haven't always been in agreement. Right? It's like, like doing like a three-legged race where you're trying to drag along some other parts of you towards a certain direction and, and there's always this, this sense of conflict. And understanding this distinction within ourselves will allow us to better understand ourselves. All right? There's a degree of freedom that will come in understanding, all right, which part of me is pulling me in this direction right now? What things in me should I be encouraging? Maybe what things in me should I be fighting? 
Because God has different suggestions, all right, different things that he encourages us to do regarding each of those parts, all right? There's, there's different strategies that we can use to be overcoming in this life for each of those three parts. So if we don't understand kind of those distinctions, those divisions, we can be misapplying God's word or we won't be living out in full freedom, right? Or our identity will be placed in maybe the wrong piece of us, right? Maybe it'll be, you know, in your physical appearance where, you know, your identity completely fluctuates based on how you, you feel you look that day or maybe just all about your thought life. But, but in fact, our identity should be completely based on who we are in Christ, all right? The fact that we have this spirit. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And our spirit is, is actually who we are. Our spirit is the eternal part of us. And if you've experienced new life on the inside of you, your spirit is, is perfect. It's sinless, right? Where our spirits actually have no desire to do wrong, no desire to sin, and as a result, it's, you know, it's not like you have to fear like, man, what happens if I get to heaven? And then like, what if I mess up there? What if I sin? You won't want to, right? You won't want to sin once you're in heaven. Your spirit doesn't have that desire once you've experienced that new life. But there's a problem with mankind's spirits, all right? There's an issue. And in order to understand that issue, we're going to have to go back to the original story. We're going to be looking at Genesis once again today and understand this issue that, that our spirits have, all right? Because our spirits, the way we're born, we're not born into this world fully operational. Where God, who designed us in his image, right? He had intention, he had purpose, but we're broken right now. We come into this world partially broken. But I want to point out that in this original story, we see that, that God made us and everything else. And as creator, he's the one who gets to call the shots, Right? Last week, we talked about the fact that he's made all mankind in his image. Regardless of whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, you're an image bearer of God. The way he's made you reflects a part of his glory about who he is. Right? And that's one of the reasons we talked last week about the fact that, that all human life is sacred before God because it's been made in his, his image. And, and what I want to point out here is that God as creator, right, he's the one that can declare right from wrong. He's the one that calls the shots. He's in charge. So check out this passage in Genesis 2, 15. So this is God after he makes man, right? He makes Adam. He breathes life into him. He gives him a spirit. Uh, this is what he tells man. He says, uh, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it, right? So he, God gives us purpose, right? He didn't just, we're not just purposeless piles of matter that randomly came into being, we were created and designed for a purpose. So, so you matter to God, you matter to us, all right? Just so you know. Uh, verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. All right, so before I get too much into that passage, I wanna point out that God made Adam with all three parts. All right, that God gave Adam, right, a spirit, a soul, and a body. He gave him a body in order to work that garden, right, in order to accomplish his job, to be able to interact with his environment. He gave him a soul, his mind, right, to be creative, to be reasoning, to be someone that can understand a command such as this one, to, to be creative, right, where Adam, he named every animal, right, where, where God made us intellectual on purpose, right? He doesn't just want us to just kind of be like do-nothings, right? We have reasoning and emotional capability. And he also gave Adam a spirit, which was his living, his eternal part of him. It was the who he was. And at this point, man's spirit was perfect, where God made Adam in these three parts. And I want to let you know, in case you didn't realize, uh, spoiler alert, Adam ate that fruit, okay? Uh, he messed it up. He disobeyed God. And, and God noticed what God said. He said that the day you eat of it, you will surely die. But what's interesting is that the day Adam ate it, he didn't die physically. In fact, he went on hundreds of years after that. He actually, he had children, he was working, right? He was doing different things, but, but Adam didn't die physically that day. 
And that doesn't make God somehow a liar, right? God wasn't incorrect or God wasn't like, oh, I guess I was wrong in that point. It's because Adam, although he did eventually die physically at 930 years old, he did die spiritually that day. The part of Adam that passed away, the part of Adam that experienced death was his spirit, the who he was. And notice the words that God uses here. He says, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God wasn't referring to his physical body when he called him you, right? Because even though Adam's physical body was the thing that ate the fruit, all right, the, the, the part of him that decided to do that was his spirit. And the part of him that died was his spirit. And I want to point out that God called Adam's spirit you, all right? That the part of Adam that who he was, his identity was wrapped in was his spirit. And likewise for you and I, our spirit is who we are. Our spirit is us. It is, it is the thing about us that makes us us. So your spirit is who you are, and your spirit is the one that matters. So Adam ends up experiencing this, this physical death, or spiritual death, and then eventually a physical death. And, and sadly, spiritual death is, is way worse than physical death, okay? Uh, spiritual death can end up having eternal consequences to it, all right? Where physical death, we're all going to experience physical death. God doesn't remove uh, Christians or believers from experiencing physical death other than the generation that will be alive when Jesus returns, okay? They're the ones that get lucky. Maybe it's us, right? I don't know. It's getting close. We know that. But, uh, but physical death is something that even Christians and believers experience, all right? Think about the fact that even God calls some Christians to experience a physical death uh, of, of torture and martyrdom. And it's not that he's punishing those individuals, it's just that physical death is something that this fallen world now has happened. And actually, in that the physical death isn't actually that bad. And I know that's like something like, what do you mean, Brian? Like, physical death is like it. Because like we're, we're so focused on the now. This, this life we live now is often the thing that we gain most of our identity from and the thing that we're so focused on. But it's spiritual death that actually matters. Okay, I, I was just talking to a friend yesterday whose father uh, has two weeks to live, all right? And, and the, you know, my friend, understanding, you know, he's, he's upset about it. That, that's painful to go through. But his father, he was this awesome, faithful Christian man who I've known my whole life. He's, he's not hopeless or helpless in this situation, right? That even though his, his body is failing him, right, and is, is you know, going to die and and decompose, that's not who he is. His body is just something that he lives in right now. And even though this, this man's mind is slipping, or he doesn't even know the names of his children, his mind is not who he is, all right? His mind is not what his true identity's in. It's not like we're like, oh, well, that's too bad. His mind's going, there he goes. No, no, no. His spirit is who he is. And what's interesting about this guy is that even going through a situation like this, I pray that I can be so faithful to God as this man, is that after enduring pain or different things, that my friend who's been able to be by his dad's side through all of this, his dad in enduring pain would say something like this, saying, this hurts and I don't understand it, but I'm never going to blame you for it, Lord. Right? The fact that his heart, he knows the faithfulness of God and he's not going to somehow use this as an opportunity to, to curse God or to blaspheme, right? to be like, God, why are you letting this happen to me? Right? He knows that the physical death or right, the, the, the mental capacity that's going, it, it's not who he really is and that his spiritual life is what really matters. The spirit is the thing that matters in us. Okay, so this is... This is what I want to point out, is that spiritual death is far worse than physical death, okay? That being spiritually dead will have eternal consequences. And consider, I mentioned martyrs a moment ago, right? Martyrs, at times, they are willing to endure physical death for the opportunity to present spiritual life to the very people who are killing them. Right, that they consider physical death to be nothing to be compared with the spiritual life that they desire for their enemies to experience. 
right? Physical death isn't that bad. And I, I know, I guess maybe I haven't experienced it, right? So I, maybe I, I'm not a full authority on that point. But I want to point out that in terms of, in scale to, in comparison with spiritual death, it's, it's not that bad, all right? That, that we get to live on eternally. And, and Adam, going back to Adam, when he sinned, he experienced spiritual death, right? From that moment on, even though he lived hundreds of years after physically, right, he was, he was half dead, right? He was, he was the walking dead at that point. And what's, what's unfortunate for us is this decision didn't just affect Adam. It's something that he passed on as a trait to all of us, that we are all born spiritually dead, right? And I realize that's offensive, okay? And actually, man, like, I've, I realize, like, man, this is a weird job. Like, I get to say offensive people who choose to come here. At least when I was a math teacher, like, those people were obligated to come and have me teach them offensive things, right? But, but you guys electively choose to come here. So, but I realize that the Word of God is offensive, okay? Uh, G- I just read a verse yesterday that Jesus said, blessed are those who are not offended with me, referring to Jesus, not me. Uh, but, but right, so, so here we go. But I, I don't intend to offend you, but I also don't want to shy away from the full reality of the spirit that's, that's at play here. I don't want to just like kind of gloss over this and be like, well, you know, whether someone's spiritually dead or spiritually alive, it's not that big of a deal. You know, no, 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 it's, it's the deal. It's the biggest deal, all right? This is why Jesus came to, to live and die and rise again, that we could be brought back to life spiritually. So, so, so man broke God's best and passed on that brokenness to the rest of us. And, and the Apostle Paul, uh, we're going to look at a passage written by him in Romans, and he talks about this spiritual death that we experience, right? And he's not afraid to tell you how bad the situation is, okay? So let, let's check this out. Romans 5.12 it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, referring to Adam, and death through sin. So, Bible says that the wages of sin is death, right? That that sin that we have leads to death, okay? And so, death spread to all men because all sinned. So, this is interesting is that, that man brought sin and thereby death into the world, Okay, and, and just like a side note, because I always like thinking about this stuff and science and everything. I love, I love science. But for my, for my friends who are maybe theistic evolutionists, I want to point out that there's a problem here, a, a little bit of conflict that you're going to experience in the sense that according to evolution, millions of years of death resulted in eventually mankind coming out of it. Where according to the Bible, God creates the world perfect, right? That man is living, right? Animals are living and man was the one that brought death into the world. So you've got a little bit of a chicken and egg situation there that I'll let you wrestle with on your own time. But, uh, but death came by one man, all right? Adam brought death into the world. That's not as God intended it, right? So the fact that we experience death, the fact that my friend's dad is going through this, right? I can sense, I feel, and I desire the world to be a better place, right? We all experience the brokenness of this world. And, and as a result, right, of Adam's decision, Adam and Eve, they messed up, we all inherited this disease of sin. We all have this spiritual death, right? Like, like a genetic disorder, it's been passed on to us. And, and, and you'd, you perhaps would want to just be able to blame Adam for this, right? Like, man, why did he mess up? Like, why did he, you know, he messed up so bad and now, now we take the hit, Right? It wasn't just him, but it's affected all of us, and that would be convenient. And I want to point out that that's actually completely human to want to blame Adam. And actually, uh, it might even be our sinful nature that makes us want to do that, because when Adam sinned, he blamed Eve, right? And then when, when Eve was asked, she blamed the serpent, right? So, so your, if your tendency is to when you're held accountable for your life before God to be like, well, no, I'm going to blame Adam, I just want to let you know in advance, like, that's not going to fly. All right, and that's what this passage says as well, is it's not something that we can just pin on him. It says, because all have sinned. 
All right, so not only did he introduce sin and death into the world, but we are all individually accountable. All right, we are all in ourselves guilty and deserving of God's judgment. Yeah, that's it's heavy stuff. So we don't just get to, to blame it on him. So this death has affected all of us, and as a result, our, our natural, right, our default state is that we're born into this world spiritually dead, right, which is just crazy, I know. Uh, Paul picks up again at verse 17. You can read through this whole chapter, uh, which, by the way, Romans is probably uh, the most, like, logically high book of the Bible to understand. So if you're reading through it ever and you're confused, that's okay. Uh, you can pray the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. And it's a good thing to have a conversation at missional communities about and things like that too. But, uh, but verse 17, this is what he says. For if because of one man's trespass or sin, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So Paul is comparing the choice and the decision of one man, Adam, to the choice and decision of one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, and the consequences of both of those decisions. And what's interesting is that through Jesus, we have an abundance of grace that is offered us where undeserved, unmerited favor is given us by God, where we now have the option of experiencing that, right? Where we didn't have a choice in what happened to us because of Adam's decision, perhaps, although we do independently make choices that, that affect us and are sinful, that we do have a choice whether or not to experience this free gift that God offers us, right? And that this righteousness that God gives us, it, it means that, that we can experience right standing with God, right? That we can be looked on as, as righteous and holy before God, right? Which is not a word that I would typically describe anything about myself, but in terms of someone who's been spiritually brought to life, that's exactly how God makes your spirit, Amen. where you are the righteousness of God in Christ. And so what Paul's saying here is that, that there is good news, and he says that the good news is, in fact, gooder than the bad news was bad, right? That's what he's pointing out, all right? You follow? And, and what he's saying is that, that we can receive this. We can receive this abundance of grace. We can receive this free gift of righteousness. And, and this is what he says, that we can, in fact, reign in life more than and to a greater effect than death ever reigned in us. Right? He's kind of comparing those two concepts, that death reigned in us, and now we can reign in life, but not out of our own efforts, not out of our own goodness or, or desire to be godly or desire to do right, but it's through Christ Jesus. Right? It's, it's only through Jesus that we can actually experience this life on the inside of us. So I want to point out that, that Jesus is the cure to our spiritual death. And even though Jesus saves us, right, I don't want to, I guess, overpromise. he doesn't save us from physical death, okay? Just so you know, I'm, you know, we're not going to be speaking that, you know, that would be false doctrine. But he does save us from spiritual death, which is the better one to be saved from. Uh, so we will st still all experience physical death uh, other than that generation that gets to be here when Jesus comes back. And actually, an interesting thing, a side note I'll mention, uh, if you read the book of Revelation, you can find out that, um, that those who become Christians, those who become believers, we actually get to be born twice and we die once. Amen. Whereas those who reject Jesus are born once and actually end up dying twice. Right. But I'll, I'll let you figure that out on your own time. V verse 18 from Romans here. It says, therefore... As one trespass or one sin led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. What Paul's using here is, is this Hebrew style of poetry called antithetical parallelism, all right, which you actually typically see in the book of Proverbs, where they contrast two ideas side by side, giving 
better clarity to each of those ideas. All right, and so you kind of see these, these parallels that Paul is using in his logic. All right, and this is what he's saying is that, that Adam's disobedience corrupted us, right, and led to us being condemned as guilty, that, that we were made sinners. But that Jesus' obedience, the obedience to the point of death on, on the cross, right, led to us being, being made righteous, right, that, that we can be made right before God and that life has been made available for us. All right, and this, in this transformation that occurs, this, this life change that happens, Jesus described as being born of the Spirit or being born again. All right, that's what Jesus talked about, that, that the way we're naturally born, being spiritually dead, we can't somehow make ourselves right with God, right? Like a dead body can't do enough good that it'll suddenly become alive again, right? Like there's no amount of good that we could do on our own to become alive. Our spirits were naturally dead. But this is what Jesus said, all right? Uh, we're going to look at John chapter 3 where this religious leader who, uh, you know, his friends would probably criticize him for becoming a Jesus follower, so he's kind of a secret Jesus follower. Uh, he comes to Jesus at night and he's like, listen, we know that you're from God because only someone who's from God can do the things and say the things you're saying, right? Uh, but this is, he's asking Jesus about, about this in verse 3 we'll pick up. John 3, 3, it says, Jesus answered him and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus communicated that without being born again, without our spirits being made alive, all right, because we've been spiritually dead, that we can't see the kingdom of God. All right, so, so we need to be born again in order to see or experience, right, to understand or grasp the way God's kingdom works. That that's the only way that it can happen. All right, that it's not just, you know, through some like logical understanding that I could like explain it or convey it to you. All right, that we need to be born spiritually in order to understand spiritual things. Elsewhere, Jesus says that blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. All right, so once our hearts have been made right with God, then we have the capacity to more fully understand who he is. All right, so that's the experience that I, I hope that if you haven't experienced Jesus like this, I hope that you would choose to do so today. Let's see, John chapter three, verse four, because this is probably confusing. Nicodemus is confused, all right, which is the name of the religious guy that's asking Jesus, by the way, uh, Nicodemus. So Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old, right? So you're probably confused too, like, Jesus, what are you talking about? Right? How can I be born again? Uh, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Like, he is way confused. All right? uh, Jesus answered him and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus makes this other claim is that, that being born again allows you to enter God's kingdom. All right, that that's the only way that it can happen, right? The the whole reason Jesus came was to deal with our spiritual deadness that we've all been born into. And so it's not unless we can be born again where our spirits come to life that we can actually even enter into God's kingdom that previously we wouldn't have been able to even see until we were born again, right? So access to God cannot be obtained through our own human effort, And being spiritually alive is what will actually allow us to enter God's kingdom. Let's see, verse 6. Jesus says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay, so Jesus is making a distinction. You've got multiple parts to you. All right, there's more things at play than just what you see. Right, the Bible says in uh, one of the Corinthians books, I don't remember which, that, that the things which are seen are temporary, while the things which are unseen are are eternal, okay? So, so this is what Jesus is talking about, that there's more at play than just what you see. Verse seven, he says, don't marvel, all right? Don't be astonished, all right? That I said to you, you must be born again. So Jesus is saying, this is a mandatory experience in order to experience and enter into God's kingdom is that you have to be born again. You need to be born spiritually, all right, we've all been born physically. We've all been made in the image of God, as I talked about last week. But being born of the Spirit, we can become children of God, is what the Bible says. 
all right, that we can actually be brought to new life. And Jesus makes this distinction where he doesn't leave room for kind of all religions being the same and bringing you to the same God, all right? That he doesn't leave that, that option open. He says, you must be born again. And in fact, what's interesting is that he's not even speaking just to Nicodemus here. Uh, the, the, the word you in the Greek is plural, all right? So like our friends Ben and Zach who planted this church, Jesus is saying, y'all must be born again, all right? That's what, that's what he's saying, that all of us, all right? This wasn't just specific to Nicodemus, but it's an invitation to everybody. Picking it up later, Jesus then connects, okay, how do I become born again? And he connects it to our belief in receiving who Jesus is. John 3, 16, you've probably heard this one, but don't tune out as a result. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So I want to let you know, even though maybe you're offended by some of the things the Bible says, uh, that God loves you, and that God acts and is motivated by his love for you. When Jesus walked on this earth, the things that he did, the miracles that he did, he did out of compassion for people. And the people that even choose to reject him, Jesus wept over and desired that. He says, how often I've wished that I could just gather you in my arms, right? right? That God is motivated by love. So I don't, I hope that I don't ever come across as just being like, you know, condemning and whatever and offensive. God loves you, all right? We love you, okay? Uh, so, so God loves us enough that he wanted to restore the broken relationship that humanity had with him. And Jesus links spiritual uh, birth with belief in him, where eternal life is obtained once again, right? What Adam lost, what Adam surrendered in the, the choice that he made and that we've continued to make when we're rebellious against God, right? That we can be reconnected. We can experience spiritual life through Jesus. And I, I want to point out that Jesus doesn't just mean like your life gets changed it means that you experience life, all right? That it's not that Jesus can just simply, uh, you know, take a, a bad person and make them good. Jesus takes a dead person and makes them alive, all right? So it's, 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 it's way different than that. And that's why there's no amount of like good deeds that I could do to try to make myself alive. It's, it's different than that. Let's see, before I read these last two passages, let's have the, the worship team kind of recollect. But verse 17 because maybe you've only ever heard of John 3, 16. Uh, but verse 17 and 18 get interesting. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. That's good news, right? Jesus didn't come to condemn us. All right? That he came to love and pursue and seek and save that which was lost. But he came, right, in order that the world might be saved through him. That was Jesus' mission. But I want to point out that even though he didn't come to condemn, he came to save. And if we reject that saving, we've got a problem. It's not like we can just be like, nah, I don't need the Jesus saving, I'm good. Because that was the whole reason that he came. And it explains this further in verse 18. It says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So although Jesus didn't come to condemn us, that's been our natural default state, right? That because we've been spiritually dead, we're naturally sinful, we're rebellious against God, we want to live our lives our way, do things the way that we want to do them, right? That, that we're already condemned. So although that wasn't the, the mission that Jesus had to, was to condemn us, he's like, listen, listen, you're already condemned, but I, I came to save the world, right? I came to save you. So I don't want you to think somehow that, that God is so loving that, you know, somehow we're all just saved automatically, okay? Because, because God does love you, but he's also holy and just and righteous, Right? And that this, this condemnation, this spiritual death that we've experienced, he has a remedy for it. He loved us enough to pursue us, to give us the opportunity to become spiritually alive. 
But it's not something that we can just ignore. Like Jesus said, you must be born again. And, and in encountering Jesus and experiencing that, that life and experiencing what he gives us, at some point, it's not just a matter of believing in Jesus, right, that he came to save us, but we then realize that once again, ooh, that relationship is reconnected, right? That just like back in the original garden, right, that, that we realize that he's, he's God. And just like God originally got to call the shots, we realize that he is the Lord of our lives, that he gets to call the shots for us, right? And that we need to choose to submit to what he says, right? He is, he's Lord for a reason. It's not just like a title that we gave him just because it sounded nice. He's Lord because he's someone that deserves to be obeyed, okay? And that obedience is done out of love. It's not out of trying to earn his favor or love. That obedience is out of already being fully received and accepted and born again into his family. So if... If you haven't ever experienced life through Jesus, you can make that choice today. It's a free gift is what the Bible said that God offers to us. All right, That's, it's a free gift. And all you have to do is as simple as Jesus put it, you just have to believe in the one that God provided to make us right. You just have to believe in Jesus. And that's something that I want to let you know that you can do just between you and God. All right, you can during this last song you can just pray to God and just say, God, I'm, forgive me for my past. Forgive me for the things I do wrong, right? I, I want to be right before you. Bring life into me. I believe in Jesus and what he's done, that he died on the cross for my sins and that he was rose, raised from the dead, right? That's something that you can do on your own. But if, if you want someone to pray with you, if you want someone to talk with you, all right, I'll be available in the back and I'd, I'd be glad to do that. But before we do this, uh, let's just pray real quick as a family. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Uh, we thank you that, that even when we messed up, even when we were dead in our sins, you chose to come and die for us, that we could be made alive, that it's something that, that none of us deserve, that none of us looks upon any other with judgment because we were all equally guilty. But God, I thank you that you make us spiritually alive. I thank you that through our spirits and our identity being placed in Christ, that we can be confident in who you've made us to be. And that through the rest of this series, as we understand the way our soul and our mind works and, and the way our bodies work and the way we should interact with those things, that God will be able to live in this life conquering, that we can reign in life in freedom, that we would not be slaves to sin any longer. And I pray, God, that the life that you give us would be so evident to the world around us that, that they would see our good works and they would give you glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.